Welcome to the AIRL podcast, the show where we explore the fascinating world of artificial intelligence and its impact on our lives. I'm your host, Mark Kelly, and I'm thrilled to have you joining us today. Each week, we delve into the cutting edge developments, breakthrough technologies, and innovative applications of AI right here in Ireland and beyond. As Ireland emerges as a global hub for AI research and development, we are here to bring you insightful conversations with leading experts, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who are at the forefront of this exciting revolution. So get ready to expand your knowledge and be inspired by the incredible possibilities that lie ahead. But before we dive in, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy what you hear, we'd love it if you could leave us a review and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. Together, let's spread the AI revolution. Hi everyone, it's Mark Kelly, founder of AI Ireland. Wherever you are in the world today, I hope you're doing really, really well. Today we are chatting with Sabine Louette. Sabine is CEO and founder of SciencePod. And for those that have been listening to the podcast for a while now, you'll know that Sabine has been on the podcast before and had a fantastic, really interesting episode that we shared um, probably over a year ago now at this stage. Sabine, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you for the invitation and it's always a pleasure. Do you mind just giving our listeners a bit of a recap on SciencePod and what you look to try to do and help uh, with your uh, users? Yes, so SciencePod um, was founded um, nine years ago, almost uh, to the day in October. And she uh, basically, we're specialising in creating digital content that's specifically designed to be engaging and compelling. And most of our content is related to science and technology explainer. So you're helping people really, really in that kind of science research kind of specific kind of niche. Exactly. And yeah. to, to be fair, we are, most of our content would be read by people in the wider knowledge economy. And tell us your background. How did you get into this this field? And I know we covered this before, but just as a quick refresher, like how did you come up with that mindset to kind of go after this particular niche? So I'm trained as a, a physicist. I, I did study fundamental physics. And then at the end of my studies, I decided to go into uh, science publishing, which I was very fortunate to work in um, in London and in New York. Uh, for nature biotechnology, among others. Uh, but what I noticed at the time was that only a handful of scientists who were la creme de la creme would um, get coverage in wider circles. And, and that was a bit of a shame because there's so much good work out there and so few people know about it and um, something had to be done. I have made a business and an earning living from actually being never being the smartest person in the room that I've interviewed with. And I'm like, I think of close to 500 interviews with leaders, you know, around the world, variety of different areas. And this is probably going to be another example of that with, uh, with your physics background. I can only imagine the types of people and individuals that you're working with day to day who are just extraordinary, clever and, and smart. And, um, you know, it is truly an honor to be interviewing people like yourself, because I, how your brain works and the type of problems and challenges that you're working on day to day, I always admit that I'm never going to be in that kind of in that kind of area. But there's obviously a challenge because sometimes when you're working on these really complicated, challenging problems, getting your information out there, your research, is it fair to say marketing is probably not one of their biggest, strongest suits and actually kind of are, get articulating a, the value that they're doing day to day and kind of getting it out to a wider audience? Yeah, you're pointing um, the finger on a very important issue here among uh, knowledge economy professionals. Um, so the, not only uh, are they very good at what they are doing, but only a fraction of them can explain it in layman's terms. So what we specialize in is translating complex ideas into simple words, but that could be specifically aimed at audiences such as policymakers. So it doesn't need to be dumbed down, you know, uh, for a 12 year old every time. It has to be uh, sufficiently um, accessible for another professional who is not skilled in that particular topic to understand. Yeah, um, and I think it's a very, very relevant point because it one is the kind of dumbing down to a 12 year old or a technical 
you know, just lower that kind of bar down. But also, it people don't have the time to yeah, to so try to go through all this information, research it, fact check it, fact check it, kind of understand the kind of my areas because we we are digitally distracted, and we find it very difficult to to stay on task, let alone go through something that's you know you need to be you need to have your brain in gear to start engaging with it, the subject matter that is. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we there's actually a term to describe what you're uh, referring to. It's the attention economy. So everyone um, around any of these knowledge economy professionals, uh, such as scientists or healthcare professional, is trying to get a word in and capture their attention. And and what's also happening at the moment in the economy because things are slowing down and companies and organizations are not recruiting. And this is the perfect storm for these professionals to feel overwhelmed and unable to cope with the sheer volume of information that they have to ingest every day of the week to be able to do their job. So we need to find a new way to engage with them um, as external, you know, uh, corporation doing R&D or um, academic institution doing research um, so that um, we um, they get delivered compelling story that they can digest in three to five minutes. Yes, and getting that across because that is a challenging problem to solve is taking that down and getting the most important pieces, making them available for that end user to, to, to pick through. So, so how are you helping them? Um, so essentially we save them time. Um, we work for people who are trying to influence those scientists and those knowledge economy professional. And, and in order to help them, we summarize complex uh, studies or complex information in a way that can be digested in less than five minutes. So we have proven that uh, by creating simple summaries alongside a scientific study, the number of people downloading the original work is actually higher, three times as high according to some of our uh, customers. And when they do indeed spread the word further afield through PR networks and other wider uh, distribution networks, such as the wider media, then the number of download of original studies can go uh, fivefold. Um, again, this is anecdotal evidence, but this is what our customers are telling us. So three to five fold, people are going to really, really appreciate that. Even if you got like, you know, two and a half to three, that's something that that's very, very impactful, uh, taking that into consideration because you are just trying to to get closer to that audience and, and making them uh, get insights. And you know, within three minutes, that's, that's a, a, a massive impact. So what type of AI are you actually using and how are you utilizing it? Okay, so our preference was to uh, focus on natural language processing, which is one of the subcategory of AI available, which essentially is based on trying to get a computer to understand human language. And with these sort of um, algorithm, one of the things that's quite commonly done nowadays is an um, extractive summarization. In other words, we're teaching the algorithm to cherry pick the most relevant information in a given document. We specialize in doing this for peer-reviewed uh, publications, scientific publications, but we are also evolving our thinking to extend this sort of solution to maybe clinical uh, trial protocol and other complex document uh, reports and so on that, that you know, our clients might need to summarize to get to the point quicker. And ultimately, the reason for summarizing is to tease people into reading the more uh, substantial document. It's not the, it's to save them time, but also interest them in something more substantial. It's funny when we first did the interview, people may have kind of heard about that kind of summarization and that 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 kind of technology. However, now that we're doing the interview, because we've had kind of November two thousand twenty-two with OpenAI and. ChatGPT and kind of Bard and you know, generative AI has come to the fore now, even though the technology has been a while and we've got a new interface, but people are utilizing this case studies. So myself personally, if I find an article that's technical, I will take it. I'll ask ChatGPT, please explain the basic business simple points of this. And it, and it does a job. However, 
there are some there's some downsides because there's usually probably some hallucinations in there outside of that. So can you tell us a little bit more deeper in terms of that technology and how you're kind of helping there? Yeah. So this is the the, the the word you've been using. Hallucination is really what the issues are at the moment with um, the likes of large language models such as ChatGPT or Bard, um, and they are known to hallucinate because they are trained to give an answer at all cost, even though they may not have the reference corpus of work to double check that their answer is right. They'd rather spit out an answer at all costs rather than check. So this is the difference between natural language processing type approach where you extract only sentences from the source document and therefore is reliable. And this is really important in science versus something that will try and give you an answer to make you happy regardless of whether it's accurate. So that, that's that's where the two different approaches differ, but at the same time, it's not excluded to use a large language model to refine the work of a, an extractive summarizer. And yeah. most of the time, what people are currently doing is using a professional editor to polish um, the outcome. Yeah, because if anyone's used the tool and it does have an hallucination, it's so, you know, there's so much conviction in the point that, you know, it is the right answer. And then when you ask some follow up questions, it kind of it kind of it kind of takes the hand out of the cookie jar and kind of like, yeah, OK, sorry, I've got this wrong. Uh, you want to go at it again. So you, you, I can understand why there's some definitely some some limitations that people I'm, I think I'm sure people are aware of them. But it's it's very very important because you don't want to get a, a hallucination, something that you've got you've got you've really missed the point. I'm actually, actually being able to try to clearly articulate to you what those summarizations were. So when you look at some of the supports that you're actually engaging and and helping with some of those people, and you're conscious of those limitations, where do you start to build up that kind of pool of people that you're engaging with, those subject matter experts, and how do you start then helping them have a voice to kind of get their get their words out there, get their get their best work out there? And um, so um, most of the time we work with uh, corporates who are trying to put forward their latest innovations. Or occasionally we also work with science publishers who are representing the innovation of these corporates. So in order to deliver their message, we typically create um, summaries in two ways. On the one hand, we have these AI summaries, which are extractive summaries, and we deliver them in the shape of news feed that can be customized by keyword to your preferred topic. That's our new uh, SIO wire uh, widget um, solution. But we also have a more premium approach when it comes to the most important of the work of our clients. And we tend to use uh, and rely primarily on science and medical writers because they get it right and they tell the story in a way that's really, really elegant. So when the story is told in an elegant way with nuances, this is something an AI doesn't do very well, by the way, then you get more impact and you are more convincing uh, to your audience. So, so, so we work with both ways, with the, you know, the professional on the one hand and the AI tool, and sometimes we combine both. I'm really, really excited to unveil my new book, AI Unleashed, Navigating the AI Revolution as a Business Executive, which is now accessible to purchase on Amazon and Amazon Kindle. This publication is the fruit of half a decade's worth of meticulous research and high level conversations with experts in the field, both in Ireland and globally. The book is particularly timely, featuring current discussions on AI governance in the European Union and North America. If you're aiming to grasp the full scope of AI, ready your enterprise for its transformative power and utilize it to your advantage, this book is specifically crafted for you. It serves as a pragmatic guide clarifying misconceptions and presenting real world insights for leaders entering the AI sphere. The book covers an extensive array of subjects from AI's role in diverse industries to generative AI applications and provides guidance on avoiding typical missteps in AI initiatives, all supported by the most recent studies. Additionally, the book highlights case studies and applications that have earned accolades at AI awards throughout the years and amplifies top-notch AI utilization in Ireland.
For executives, poly architects or technology aficionados seeking to make sense of the intricate world of AI, AI Unleashed Navigating AI Revolution is your essential handbook. So it's now available on Amazon. This book furnishes you with the expertise and instruments required to employ AI both effectively and ethically. So when you look at the future of where this is kind of evolving and going, because the cheese is always moving. We've seen the announcements at OpenAI this week, Meta this week, Microsoft this week. It's hard to keep up. It's moving so quickly. How do you kind of try to stay ahead of the game here? So we, we're definitely keeping an eye on all these developments and we're embracing them. So we are testing um, this sort of, uh, you know, GPT-4 and all these things that are coming out, we're trying to find ways to integrate multiple AI solutions together to produce something that's even more valuable for our audience. For instance, at the moment, we're experimenting with um, finding the most cited studies around a given keyword, which is provided by one of our partners. Then we also have uh, another uh, partnered solution that would give you the top five studies to answer a very simple question that you ask in plain language. So this, in 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 the big picture, adds on a level of context, um, it vis-a-vis the kind of t- the subject matter you're you're focusing on. When you look at the future and how people are going to liaise and engage and work with some of these tools. What are you really excited about? Uh, I'm excited about the fact that there is a gain in productivity that's really possible. However, I also want to manage people's expectations because what's happened with the hype surrounding the the large language models is that people's imagination has run wild as to what an AI can do. And in reality, it can only do so much and it has its its intrinsic um, limitation that we've discussed prior to this. And so uh, I'm glad that we're we're living this time and it's very exciting. But I, I really think that it's going to take quite a lot of time for organizations, large organizations, to harness those skills because you need to hire people who understand them and we they need to experiment. They need to be given the license to experiment. And not every company or organization has that culture of fail um, of failure and, and fail better, you know, next time around, as as they say. Yeah, you're a fail better and agile approach. And, you know, it really does kind of kind of come off the tongue so nice and it sounds really good. But when you're failing and you're not really doing well, it's, it's actually a very painful experience. So so as much as people say, you know, fail fast and, you know, these MVPs and I've heard the terminology for 15 years, I prefer not to if I can and actually try to learn from others and, and try to try to give give the best. From a business executive listening in to this episode, How do you start to harness this or is there any kind of low hanging fruit that you'd recommend they start to do? Okay, so there's an obvious one, which is anything to do with formulaic text production, like protocol, processes, recipes, step by step guideline. These can be uh, generated by AI solutions. Anything to do with um, SEO um, production for your website. And there's some amazing uh, writing school t- tools nowadays, which are developed on the back of the like of GPT technology and uh, that help you save tremendous amount of time. What you'll notice, though, with these sort of writing is that it's more like technical writing. It's really boring. It ha- doesn't have flavor, doesn't have a soul, doesn't have a, a tone that's engaging. So you need to you need to keep these sort of AI um generative AI solutions for a certain category of document in your organization. I would um, I would really encourage people to experiment with new tools. There's tools to dub videos in multiple language, to uh, reinvent podcasting um, again in multiple languages. There's so much out there that I think people have to start just looking for themselves or hiring people just for the purpose of uh, experimenting and these people um, you'll find them straight out of universities 
and you just need to give them a bit of freedom to um, to to start and try uh, solving some of your problems. It's great advice, and you can also build on that by using tools that create videos. That you just put in text a video, it'll create a video, it'll create an avatar to actually do that training video. So let's use the example for safety. You could create a, a training video on a car being driven reverse back into the car space because we know if the person drives out of the car space uh, the correct way, there's less accidents. Or if a person's walking up the steps, holding onto a rail, there's less accidents. So there's loads of different standing operated procedure videos you can create within seconds as well. But as you said, you just need to actually start playing around with it and introducing it and having that kind of low hanging fruit that you can work through in terms of operating procedures, manual health and safety kind of books that you could read that are very, very straightforward and you would follow that procedure too. So there's a lot of really great things for, for business owners, big and small, to start to introduce. So Sabine, what is next? What's coming down the line? So I know you've got a variety of different ambitious plans to, to introduce different types of products. What have you got planned? So we've just launched a minimum viable product in the shape of a, a newsfeed widget, which allows corporate organization to influence their target audience, such as doctors, for instance, by giving them an update of the latest research studies provided as summaries. And this can be fully customized if you only care about COVID or, you know, GLP-1, which is the molecule behind these appetite suppressant that everybody's talking about. Um, so for that, plan is to try and get as wide and as large an adoption of these sort of solution as possible. So we're fundraising at the moment, a seed round, and we welcome inquiries about this, but we're also co-partnering with other organizations, uh, among others, a technical writing company in Ireland or other uh, organization to try and co-develop products that may bring more value to our customers, uh, combining skills and expertise. And um, Sabine, how do people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about your company and more about the, the different product offerings you have? Okay, so uh, the simplest way is to contact me through LinkedIn, uh, Sabine Louet, L-O-U-E-T. Uh, and also our website is at sciencepod.net. And feel free to engage through the website. There's a direct link to my Calendly, so you can book a meeting very easily. And um I would like to thank you, Mark, for the opportunity to uh, to share. Today. Thank you very much, Sabine. Really, really pre appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Membership of AI Ireland places your organisation at the centre of the fastest growing technology sector in the world today. As a member, you'll have access to a diverse and highly engaged professional community, which is committed to driving artificial intelligence forward in Ireland. Membership of AI Ireland is for any organisation employing data and analytics. We offer memberships to corporate, government and SME organisations. Interested to find out more, contact mark at AIawards.ie.